Hey, Jess here. Just popping in here to say that I'm taking a couple weeks off from releasing new episodes for a little R&R, but in the meantime, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to share with you some of my favorite and most downloaded episodes of Mamas in Training. This episode was originally number 53, back when it was the Pumping Podcast, with Nikki Bergen. Nikki, I can now say, and I'm grateful to say, has become a beautiful connection and support for me over the last year. She's the founder of The Bell and Bump Method, where she teaches women how to activate your pelvic floor through exercise. And let me tell you, I took one of her classes recently, and it doesn't look like much, but man, are your muscles on fire the next day. (laughs) Also, one of my dearest friends has taken her bump method course because she's pregnant and has found huge comfort in preparing for birth in an empowering way. Nikki had her second baby in the midst of the pandemic, and I just love her and her story, and I know you will too. I am sitting with Nikki Bergen today. She is a Canadian mama of two and that sweet little one that she has in her arms. Welcome, welcome. I'm so happy you're here. Uh, I'm happy that we managed to make this work. And I also hope that this little man behaves so your listeners do not have to hear too much crying in the background. You know what? I'm sure all of my listeners are used to it. So whatever he needs, no big deal. Whether he needs to feed or whatnot, just do what you need. It's all good. So your son, the little guy that you're holding right there, was born this past Mother's Day in the heart of the pandemic. (laughs) Oh my God. May 10. May 10. It's been exactly four months today, actually. Today's his four-month birthday. Oh my goodness. Perfect timing. (laughs) So I want to go back first to life before motherhood. If you can dive back into that time. What was life like? What were you doing? I, I was still teaching what I'm teaching now. So I'm fortunate in that I discovered my passion even before I had kids. So I've been a Pilates instructor for about 13 years now. Um, And before that, I was a dancer, injured myself as a dancer, discovered Pilates, it fixed my knee, fell in love with it, started teaching Pilates certified. um, Yeah, about 13 years ago now. And then I was teaching and I gradually developed my company, The Bell Method, um, and then created a separate kind of entity called The Bump Method, because I realized that pregnant and postpartum women needed something specific to them. Um, so it, and it really is something that I'm passionate about because women are not getting this information about their pelvic floor, even information about how to birth in a way or how to advocate for themselves in a way that's going to leave them best and in the best possible situation for a smooth recovery. And, and I think also the way that we birth has a huge impact on us, especially if it's been a traumatic experience, it can really have a lasting impact. So it's either for a lot of women, one of the most empowering experiences or one of the most traumatic experiences I've, I've noticed in, in the people that I speak with. And so I really feel like education should start much earlier, even 10 years before we even consider having kids. And what is it that we can do to feel comfortable and empowered in our bodies to, you know, really learn about our pelvic floor, learn about our core, you know, and, and feel confident in our own skin, comfortable and confident advocating for ourselves. You know, there, a lot of the stuff out there is avoidable. Unfortunately, we just don't yeah. get the information until it's too late. hundred percent. But basically I graduated from my Pilates training program. It took over a year. Um, I did the apprenticeship and everything. And I had worked for years in a studio environment as a ballroom dancer. And I knew I wanted something different. I had done a studio environment. So I ended up purchasing a reformer, which is like a very big piece of equipment in Pilates. And I ended up cold calling a whole bunch of sport medicine clinics because I was like, do you have Pilates? If you don't, I can provide it for you. You know, and it didn't take long. And a sport medicine clinic was like, yeah, we'd love to do Pilates. So in in hindsight, it was the best thing I could have done because here I am, a new grad, and all of a sudden I'm in a sport medicine injury clinic and I'm getting this patient caseload of people. I was way in over my head. I I had a firefighter with a herniated disc. And then the next hour I'd have, you know, a 16-year-old with scoliosis and a rod in her spine. And then the next hour I'd have a pregnant woman you know, who had a history of osteoporosis at 40. Like it was very complex. And I was a new grad in my mid twenties. And I was like, I have to study. (laughs) So I would study and I would learn and I would 
interview the chiros and the physios and the massage therapists and try to figure out how can I best support this person. So I learned a lot quickly, Mm -hmm. but eventually these people's insurance would run out and they'd be like, I want group classes because I don't, I can't afford to keep doing these privates. And so I developed the Vell method around injuries and special populations where it's like, can we create a challenging class that's accessible to a lot of people that's mindful of their injuries and their, their specific needs. Mm. So that's kind of how it started. So it's Pilates, but it's a lot of physical therapy mixed in. Um, and of course I have my dance background. So I was like, we need to make this fun. It can't be boring. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we add, I add music to it. Um, so mm. I'm, I'm weaving it all together. And then it's the same thing. It's just the bump method is that exact same model, but really specific to pregnant and postpartum women. That's so helpful too, because I find that, you know, there are a lot of people that you can follow on social media and things like that, that give you individual exercises that you can do, especially I see as a pregnant mom or postpartum mom, but to actually have a full method that someone's working through and someone who's gone through the research and done it before they've even been pregnant. And that's, you were really fulfilling a need, I think that was not there. (laughs) I mean, it started because I had women, I was teaching, I, I've taught everything. I've been teaching fitness. I'm almost 40. I've been teaching fitness since I was 18. So I've been yeah. doing a lot of this for a long time. Dance, like Zumba, step classes. I've taught it all aerobics, <laughs> <laughs> Pilates, yoga. But so I've been, I've been that exercise bunny on the microphone in your gym that you've seen. For, <laughs> that, that has been my life. Um, and I realized that women, you know, in my boot camp, I was teaching one time, mid twenties at the time. Uh, I, I think I was in the middle of certifying with my uh, my Pilates certification, and they were all like, "Oh, I can't do that move. I'm not wearing a pad." And I was like, "What? <laughs> what do you mean?" And it was a ladder drill, so it was kind of like you know, you see football players running through tires, like jumping, like that kind of yeah. like. They were like, "Oh," and and like half the class was like, "Oh, I can't do that." And these were women in their late thirties, early forties. And I was like, this is weird. I need yes. to learn more. And so that was just a sign. I knew that like these women were, you know, needing, I, I was like, this can't be my destiny. <laughs> like mm-hmm. this can't be everybody's destiny. You know, we need to, the, the, the trajectory doesn't get better. It's not like if you, if you have this issue when you're 35, by the time you're 50, it's not getting any better unless you deal with it, you know? Yeah. I mean, at 35, you're still so young and that's where a majority of women are having their first child. So if you can get that taken care of beforehand, I mean, gosh, that's so important. For sure. Yeah. I mean, and if anyone's listening to this being like, crap, like I'm, you know, I have my baby, I'm having these issues. It's not too late. I think that's a question that often people are like, oh no, I haven't done anything proactive or I'm dealing with all these symptoms. And is it too late for me? It's probably one of the top questions. And the answer is no, it's not too late for you. (laughs) There's definitely a lot that we can do and should do um, postpartum to really heal ourselves. Yeah. All the links to the bell method and the bump method, as well as your Instagram and everything will be in the show notes. So mom is listening. You can go check all of that information out there. So I can't wait to hear about that little guy, but first your first pregnancy and birth with your daughter, what was that experience? Like, was it, how was it, how was it different or similar? So I, <laughs> you guys are getting to know everything about me as I try to feed this little monster. <laughs> myself. So basically come here, buddy. Um, I have, was born, I was born with a heart condition called SVT. Um, it stands for supraventricular tachycardia. It's an arrhythmia and it's an electrical arrhythmia. And so it was something I, I knew I had since the age of 14 and it got progressively worse. Um, and then I started needing meds for it. Um, not like beta blockers, like on a regular level, but I would have episodes where my heart rate would go from regular, you know, 70, 80 beats per minute to 170 beats mm. per minute. And you would, sometimes I would need to call an ambulance and get an injection, which is very like, think of it, you know, in Pulp Fiction, they do the paddle thing mm-hmm. like that only intravenously. So it's very dramatic. And, um, and I've had that happen a few times. And then of course, what I didn't realize was that it gets way worse during pregnancy just because the cardiac load and the blood volume in your body is higher. And so, so your heart will work harder. So you're more likely to go into this episode of SVT. Mm. I was in and out of the ER. I had already gone through IVF. That's a whole other podcast for you. Exactly. (laughs) But but essentially um, it was getting worse and worse. And I had to get this drug during pregnancy, which 
really freaked me out. And I thought it's one thing if it's my body, I don't want to harm a child. Like I don't know what this drug's going to be doing to them. So there's a surgery that you can do to fix it. And I was very anxious about having it done. But once I became a mom, it was like, I, I finally managed to get the courage to fix it. Whereas prior, I was like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. They have to stick wires in my heart when I'm awake. I don't want to do this. I ended up doing the, um, doing the surgery at four months postpartum after my first daughter. But the backstory of that is that I was told that I would likely need an epidural because of my heart condition. And I had gone through all this ER, in and out of the ER, I'd gone through IVF. And in my brain, I was like, I just want one thing with no interventions. Give me one thing without needing help, quote unquote. And it was something that I felt like I wanted to prove to myself, like that my body could do it. Um, and it's all on me. It wasn't about proving thing to anyone. And so I remember my plan was I am going to do my best to not have an epidural because I wanted to just see if my body could do it. Cause you know, you have this feeling like something's wrong with you perpetually, the IVF and the, the whatever, the hard stuff. And so anyways, I ended up getting an amazing doula, which I would recommend to everybody. Um, and I stayed at home as long as I could. I showed up at triage in the hospital at six centimeters already, which was great. Um, and I'll never forget, there was this really crusty nurse. There's always one. <laughs> yes. And I show up and, and the lights are in triage are so bright. Like it is the opposite of the environment that you really want to be in. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember she didn't even come up to me. She just like yelled down the hall. It says on your chart, you need an epidural. And I was like, and this was the moment where I was like, I am going to advocate for myself. And I was like, it says it's recommended, but it's not mandatory. And she just went huh, and like went off. Oh my goodness. And, and I was like, and I didn't, I'm like, yeah, because if I get an epidural, I'm not as loud. I'm not annoying you. I'm a better, more compliant patient. Mm -hmm. no, that's not what I want because of my own history. What I, my, my, my birth goal was. I want to see what I can do. And I was progressing quickly, right? And epidural could have slowed that down. So things were looking good. Long story short, nurses changed. I got a better nurse. <laughs> and goodness. there was a bathtub in the hospital. So I had an unmedicated birth and it was 12 hours from first contraction to end. So it was really probably very healing for me. No, it was definitely very healing for me, given everything that I had gone through um, up until that point to be like, I could do this. Like my body is not a lemon. I could. Right. Um, and so that was my story with my daughter. And then I had that heart surgery four months postpartum. And then of course, with my little guy here, who's now four months old, that's a whole other story. And I was able to have another unmedicated birth, which I wanted, but instead of 12 hours, it was three hours. And so with the heart condition with your son was after the surgery that was taken care of, that wasn't a problem anymore or concern, I uh, should say? I had one episode very briefly in pregnancy with him, but it went away. I didn't need meds for it. Um, and so they actually, I called the electrophysiologist, which is the type of cardiologist that he is. And they're like, yep, no, we consider this a medical cure. And apparently this particular procedure, it's called an ablation is the most successful surgical procedure in all of medicine. Wow. It has like a 97% success rate and it's pretty low. So I was like, okay, amazing. <laughs> yeah. And so now clearly there were some things to navigate around that, but going into the birth of your son, how did your birth plan and what you wanted to happen change or evolve? You still wanted to be at home, I would imagine. I wanted to be in the hospital and then COVID oh. happened. And then I was like, I'm going to stay at home because I want to have everybody there because the hospital had well, at home. I was able to have my doula, the same person who helped me last time, my husband. And I, I switched. I had an OB the first time and then I wanted midwives just, just, I was like, I'm going to try something new. Yeah. Um, but because of COVID, they were like, you know, you can only have one person. So I had to choose in the hospital. And I was like, I don't want to have to choose. Let's do this at home. I know that I'm capable of, of having a birth without meds. Let's just do this at home. I had the birth pool, the tub, the whole, the whole setup. It was. Okay. So, so you got to take us through. Okay. So it's, I want to, I can't believe this story. Okay. Go, go for it. I need popcorn. <laughs> I love that you're like a birth story junkie. I love it. Okay. I think it's amazing. So I, uh, what happened? So it was very similar. I woke up in the middle of the night. You go, I went 
when pee, like you're pregnant, you always pee in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. And I started getting like sharp period, like cramps. And I was like, okay, I recognize, I remembered that it was the same with my first. And I know that every labor can be different, but for me, it was felt very similar to my first experience. And so I was like, okay, I think it's happening. And then immediately for me, it was timeable. Like it was like, get my app out. I'm like, yep, they're happening like a minute apart. Like it was very, not a minute. They were lasting a minute and a couple minutes apart. So I go into the bathtub and I'm just sitting in the bathtub and I text my doula. I call my midwife. I'm like, guys, I'm pretty sure it's happening. And they were like, well, you're a second time mom. It was pretty fast for the first time. We're, we're going to take you seriously. We're coming over. And I think it was like maybe four in the morning. Yeah, four in the morning. And um, I'm in the bathtub and it's, it's ramping up, but I'm breathing through it. My husband, of course, is pacing because he's just like, ah. <laughs> This is why I chose my doula over my husband, guys, because he is, bless his heart, does not, he can't even watch Grey's Anatomy with me. Like he's <laughs> So I was like, you are not invited into the room if you want to go to the hospital. It's so, so funny because I talked to my husband about like, wait, what do you think would want to happen? You know, what do you think in the future? And I think he's going to put on a good face, but I think he's going to be the same way. Like he doesn't want to see anything that's going to happen down there. He's like, nope, I'm going to get too creeped out, too grossed out. He's like, no. So I have a feeling he's going to be like, just focused on my face. Like, I just need to look at you. Just <laughs> no, And you want in the moment, you want like a strong maternal figure mm. who's there to instill confidence in you and be like, you've got this breathe like this close to eyes staring at you. <laughs> And he was like, he threw up three times from anxiety. Oh <laughs> like he was not going to hold space for me to do what I needed to do. And Focus so, on me here. I'm the one doing right? the hard work. Okay. Yeah. Not about you right now. Yeah. Um, but so uh, he had thrown up three times with my first um, labor, like with my daughter two years ago. And I was like, okay, you've proven yourself to be not so helpful. So you're yeah. out. It was in. Um, so it wasn't, it was, it was, a, it was hard, but it wasn't, it was an easy choice. It was not it was difficult to be in that situation, but it was an easy choice for me. So I'm in the bathtub and, um, and midwife comes over and, and I'm, my eyes are closed. I was like in my own little zone here. And she's just like, okay, Nikki, we need to check you. So she actually, I'm in the bathtub. She checks me on terms of how dilated I am while I'm still in the bathtub. And she's like, you're about seven centimeters dilated. And I was like, oh shit, that's pretty far. Um, and you t- typically go into transition around like eight, nine. So I was getting close. And so mm. she's like, okay, the water, and then she goes, the water's a little bit cloudy. And I'm like, okay. She's like, can you come out? And I didn't know what she was ta- alluding to. So I stand up and she puts one of those like puppy pads underneath me. She's like, I think your water broke. And sure enough, it broke, but it, it was not clear. It was tinged brown, which means that meconium, which is the baby's poop, went out. And so that's immediately like quite dangerous. And she's like, we got to go to the hospital now and I was like wait what <laughs> like oh you don't feel it like it's just you don't know unless yeah. someone tells you that the risk and I learned this just recently the risk with meconium is that when the baby is coming out of the birth canal they can aspirate it aka yeah. it. if they do it can mean long NICU stays it can get stuck in their lungs it's a bad thing and so she was just like you know, and she's very pro home birth. They love home birth, but she was like, I hate to say this, but like, we, we really have to get you to the hospital now. And then she checked me again. I was eight centimeters and I was like, this is happening. What am I going to do? Ah. And then she's like, we can call EMS, like the ambulance. And they're going to take you to the local hospital, like around the corner, or you can drive. She knew I wanted to go to a hospital a little bit further away. Cause my friend was on call. <laughs> And that's where my midwife's practice. And I I just, I like that hospital better. Mm. So I was like, we're not calling the ambulance. I've been in many ambulances with my heart staff. I've done that. It's not not a very calm environment. I was like, nope, we're going to drive. So of course, my husband, Mr. Pukey Pants, is like, (laughs) okay, we're going to go. And of course, second kid, I had like barely a hospital bag packed because I was like, well, I don't really need it because you know, we're at home. So I think I had like flip-flops, a hoodie and my health card. And that's about it. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. And then like, we didn't even have like enough. Like, I don't think I had, I maybe had a onesie for him and that was it. Anyway. So we get there and of course it's out of the movie. I'm like, drive faster. <laughs> like I'm holding on to the little thing on the top of the car and I'm, I can't sit because it feels like there's pressure. So I'm like leaning to one side because sitting was excruciating. Long story short, we show up at the hospital, like 
full on like no time to park, pull up, hazards on, inside you go. And there's COVID and everyone's like, as soon as you get there, there's like a big like entrance, like plexiglass everywhere, hand sanitizer. No one wants to let you in. And I'm just like, I'm having a baby. That's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> we need to speed up this process a little bit. <laughs> so, um, anyways, and then it was, and then my doula was following in her car and then we get there and they're like, who are you going to pick? And I was like, you doula, come, let's go. Her name is Lori. Lori, let's go. So we go upstairs and of course we had spoken about it before. So he knew that that was going to happen. So yeah. we, we had had that as a contingency plan and so I get to the hospital I think it was like 6 30 and he was born at 707 wow and, uh, then we got home we went home at 10 a.m holy crap like, it's true in and out but with midwives you can do that here um at least here in Toronto because they come to your house and do like you don't have to, they I had all his checkups for the first couple of weeks like from my bedroom which was amazing so Lori was a doula and a midwife? No, no. Or this is someone else? No, Lori was my doula. And then doulas are not medical. They're just right. birth coaches. And then it, I also had- Oh, so midwife. you had a separate- You have to have like someone who actually like physically, medically delivers. Right. Them. She's just right. there. The doula's there to hold my hand and like rub my back and tell me I'm doing great. Exactly. Her to like actually take care of stuff. So your midwife was at that hospital? Yeah, she followed me in her car also. It oh, was like- her <laughs> Oh my gosh. That's amazing. And so how did, I mean, apart from just the craziness of it and the rush of it and the movie type environment afterward with a pandemic going on, I mean, did that even cross your mind or were you just focused on your baby? No, I think I was more anxious about it before the birth. Once the baby was here, once he was in my arms and he didn't, by the way, need, there was no issue with the meconium. We had the respiratory therapist in the room. Oh, it was good. Good. So we were very lucky that nothing happened. It very well could have, and you don't really have control over it. But I was just happy that he was here. He was safe. Um, and uh, you kind of go into this little newborn bubble. At least I did. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, the difference this time around was that I didn't have the visitors. I didn't, you know, and in a way, in a way it was kind of nice. People would like drop stuff off on the doorstep and be like, peace out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You didn't have to entertain. Right. There was no like, worrying about like, you know, putting your boobs away and like, yeah. home there. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I was very fortunate. I think the anxiety for me was more around like, you know, is the hospital a safe place? Are we going to get something in the hospital? You know, all that stuff. You know, and, and thank goodness I have the doula that I have. She's in her 50s. She's been doing this for 20 years. She trains. She's like a, she's like the head mama doula of all the doulas. So I was very lucky to have that type of support. And I recognize that not everybody has that. Um, and I feel for a lot of women who've said that they were asked to wear a mask in labor, like things like that, that just break my heart because I don't know how I would have coped in that moment if I had to have like a mask on, you know, like it's really hard for so many women out there who don't have the same support and who have, who have other rules that we didn't have to deal with, you know? So apart from those rules that may come in place, for moms who might be listening who are pregnant and about to have a child in the midst of this uncertainty and everything else, what type of advice would you give to just to calm their hearts a little bit? Yeah, that's a great, a great question. I would say educate yourself and do research. And, and I, I mean, do research on your birth provider because birth experiences vary tremendously based on where you give birth and who's your birth provider. Even different hospitals have different section rates. Mm -hmm. and ask for that information so I went my, with my first birth like, I was very picky about which hospitals I, I went to I could have gone down the street but I was like no I'm going to drive 25 minutes and go to that hospital because it's got better outcomes so you you should educate if you can I, I understand that if people are maybe in rural areas they don't necessarily I live in a very big city we have tons of options so I'm very fortunate like that but if possible do research on, on your birth provider and try to create your birth dream team if possible. Be fussy, be picky. Like you, this is about you and don't worry about pleasing other people. Like do what you want to do. Like I didn't worry about pleasing my That's okay. <laughs> do, do, don't worry about pleasing other people, you know, like make sure that you, you are doing what is that 
you know, is important for you. You know, here, I'm trying to, of course, now I can't figure it. There it is. Do not disturb. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, that, that, and then also one of the things I tell my students, because I teach a lot of prenatal students virtually now, I think we have over 200 people in our current class, wow. but, but basically I said, girls, ladies, if you're hearing stories and, and this is something in our culture, we tend to love, like I find older women who had their kids love to share the nitty gritty and often in like a, I was in labor for 40 hours and it was the worst pain of my life. And just you wait, that shit is not helpful when you're pregnant, yeah. especially when it's a pandemic. So you can politely decline listening to that type of a story. Mm -hmm. just like, Listen, I'm dealing with a lot of anxiety right now. You know, this is actually not helping. You can actually just like kind of stop them right there and, and do your best to really like I say educate yourself and and really seek out positive birth stories so I actually have a testimonials reel on my story highlights in Instagram I've probably got like 50 positive birth stories that I deliberately share and these are stories that people have written in and I share the positive ones because we need that we hear the, the scary negative ones so often and, and I think it's, it's, you got to get your head in the game. Obviously that's hard right now with COVID, but the more you can surround yourself with empowering positive information and trust that you are in the best possible hands, it will allow you to relax a little bit and surrender to the uncertainty. If you don't trust your providers, it's going to be really hard to let go and let the birth happen, you know? Well, I think what's most important in hearing your story is while it took place at a very uncertain time and in the heart of all of this craziness, that was only a, a tiny little blip of what actually occurred. Everything else really, I mean, it was scary to deal with the possibility of, you know, the meconium and having to go to the hospital, but everything else about your birth seemed quick, seemed very comforted, very supported, very positive. And I think that's, why I asked you that question, because moms have to hear over and over that this can be scary if you allow it to, especially like with the pandemic and everything, it can be scary. But if you choose, like you said, to only let certain things filter in and to stand up for yourself and say certain things. Now, if a hospital is going to say you have to put a mask on, there might not be negotiation for that. But, you know, I, I think that's why it's, you're right. It's so good to hear those positive stories and everybody can have a scary story or a challenging story, but no matter what their individual stories of what you've gone through as a woman and what you've overcome. And I think that's, that's the most empowering thing about hearing all these stories for me, I think. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot in our culture of like, you know, you need to be, you know, for women, it's just like, we, we want to please, we're pleasers. And so in a way I try to encourage women and this can be hard depending on your personality, especially when you're in a vulnerable situation, like you are the most vulnerable ever when you're giving birth, right? Like you are in a very vulnerable situation and it can be very difficult in that moment as a woman to be like, no, <laughs> I'm doing it my way. Right. I, I think a lot of women, if I could only tell you the number of times, well, they didn't let me. I heard, I always hear that they didn't let me. And, and I'll give you an example. Like we talk about, we want you to make sure that you're not doing something called purple pushing. So they'll often train you or tell you in the hospital, hold your breath, count to 10, bear down. And essentially when you push like that, yeah, purple, it's a really intense Valsalva. And there is actually multiple studies there are multiple studies to show that valsalva pushing is way worse for your pelvic floor and you want to do something called open glottis pushing which is essentially keep breathing in a nutshell don't hold your breath and i have so many testimonials that people are saying they told me to purple push and hold my breath but i ignored them and it's just all you're doing you, they can't force you to breathe a particular no right? No, you breathe how, and you've done the research, you've educated yourself and you have less tearing that way. You have less trauma to your pelvic floor. It's a way of, of taking back your power and your control. And this is what I really want to encourage women to do. And, and it can be things like that that can make a huge difference. And so don't be afraid to, you know, educate yourself and, and advocate for yourself and stand up for what it is that you know is best practices. 
Absolutely. Amen. And then you had done that when you showed up at the hospital and that nasty, crusty nurse said, you need an epidural. And you were like, actually, no. No, I don't. You know, and she just huffed off like you're just an annoying patient, or whatever. But you know, she didn't know who she was dealing with. She yeah. didn't. You know, I'm like, I have, I am in this space. I was 36 with my first. I was a bit older, a little bit more probably confident and secure with who I am. Being like, you can't boss me around, lady. Right. But I recognize that a lot of other moms don't feel that they may not be in that situation. So I try my best to really just be like, ladies, it's okay. Like you. Don't worry about being a quote bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <You never laughs> again. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I hate all that language around. Anyway, that's another podcast yeah. language around what women can be called and things when we're standing up for ourselves. But anyway, oh my gosh, I, I'm so excited that we were able to connect. And I think it's so important at this time to hear a positive pandemic story. I you know, hate that. I can't wait till we're not talking about that anymore. But I think it's so important to hear a positive story like that. It's important to hear somebody who has taken control into their own hands, especially, I mean, you have the background that you do with the physical work and supporting other moms. And then the fact that you were able to stand up for yourself too, it's really empowering. That's what we try. I try to, you know, there have been things in my life that weren't empowering, but as it relates to birth, I've certainly been fortunate and I try to, to help other women feel the same way that I did because it can have a huge long-standing impact on how you see yourself. If you enjoyed the show today, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and leave a review on Apple Podcasts so I know how to better serve you. I'd also love for you to join our community of Mamas in Training on Facebook. You can find me at Mamas in Training on Instagram and at mamasintraining.com. For Mamas in Training, I'm Jessica Lorian. We're in this together.